All right, Jim Al Khalili, welcome to Jet. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank uh, you. What brings you to Jet? Well, we are filming a two-part series for BBC Four. Uh, which will go out later this year in the autumn, uh, called Order and Disorder. So it's, it's another one of those BBC Four, you know, mm -hmm. get, get to the nitty gritty science, and, uh -huh. we're, and we're talking about the second law of thermodynamics. Right. So coming to, to Cullum and Jet is because we want to talk about unlocking energy stored up in the early universe oh, and right. then and through fusion reactions you know uh -huh. uh, getting access to that energy so it's, it's part of our story of energy and entropy and all that yeah. all that stuff yeah i mean entropy is a word you hear a lot uh, how are you finding explaining that for a for a non-physics audience well, so entropy is a concept that even physicists very often find quite confusing. I mean, we can write down the equations and, 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 and we sort of know how to define it, but, uh, but really talking about entropy, and we know the second law of thermodynamics is one of the most important, if not the most important law in, in physics. I always think it's amusing that the most important law in physics only makes it to second place in laws of <laughs> thermodynamics. Right? But, but, but it's, it's almost entering popular culture now mm. that non-scientists, you know, people who have an interest in science, would have heard of the second law of thermodynamics. They would have heard of entropy and they say, oh, well, that's to do with how untimely idea system is or how run down something is so it's actually getting into those ideas mm. and trying to find nice analogies mm -hmm. but not shy away from explaining it properly that's that's mm -hmm. what we can do on mm -hmm. BBC 4 mm -hmm. excellent so you, how many equations oh quite a few I mean, we, uh, we, um, well um, last week we were filming in some derelict warehouse in, in, in South London and I got to write down an equation involving a logarithm on, on, a, on a window screen. Uh -huh. So, I mean, there you go. okay, it's, it's to look impressive yeah. rather than explain yeah. what logs are, uh -huh. but nevertheless, you know, the yeah. idea that you can yeah. write down equations is something yeah. has become yeah. almost fashionable now. Yeah, now this is a slightly different hat to your normal job as a professor of yes. nuclear physics. So how are you finding that transition? It's it, it, very much two different worlds. I, I, I pretty much spend half of my time now as an academic, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm still teaching undergraduate students. I have my research program in, in nuclear physics, theoretical physics more generally, but then the other half of the time I'm broadcasting, so I'm doing radio and television and writing popular science books. And I've reached this happy balance between mm -hmm. the two, mm -hmm. and I don't want to give up either. Mm -hmm. But luckily, we're, we're now in a situation, certainly in the UK, in science communication, that you can do both. And right. it's only quite a, a recent thing. Yeah. In the past, if you're an academic, mm -hmm. stick to that. Publish papers, yeah. get the research grants, yeah. Yeah. don't worry about science communication. If you go into broadcast science communication, then you leave academia behind. I, see. I don't want to do that. As a nuclear scientist working, I believe, in exotic modelling, what mm. do you mates say about that? <laughs> Exotic I'm to, modeling. <laughs> I'm off to work to do some exotic modeling. Well, I, I published a paper some years ago with the title Four Body Stripping Reactions. Lovely. Uh, and with, with the exotic modeling. And, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> exotic nuclei are atomic nuclei that have. Um, more than their fair share of neutrons or protons, so it's a, the, an imbalance. Isotopes that are very imbalanced in terms of protons and neutrons, and they tend to have very exotic structures. Mm -hmm. So uh, my interest is in, in modelling these nuclei quantum mechanically, mathematically, uh, and then running computer codes to see if the theoretical predictions match up with experiments. So, so exotic modelling means mathematical models of exotic nuclei rather than, than uh, lingerie. We all believe that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, coming back to your visit of JET, what, have you, what, what are your impressions of the, the facility and the science here? Well, uh, I think I've been here once before, and that was over 20 years ago uh, for a nuclear physics conference. And, and, and I, it was a three-day conference. I remember coming here, and we, we sat in talks all day in seminars, and then went for, for lunch in the canteen, and more in the afternoon, and off-site for dinner. I never got to see the site itself, mm. and so this is well. It, this is my first visit, essentially. Yeah. So, very excited to to, you know, to have a look around. I hadn't realised how big the site was, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you're here with a film crew and you're lugging, you know, heavy bags <laughs> full of batteries and camera lenses yeah. and so on. It's, yeah. it's you know, there, there are some distances to cover, <laughs> but uh, no, enjoyed going inside the test mm -hmm. facility, Taurus. And, and, and okay, it's not the real jet Taurus, but it, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, yeah. it's the same thing. And that's mm -hmm. you know one of those iconic mm. 
places in yeah. science that it's, it's quite quite yeah. quite nice to see firsthand. Mm. And impressions of the the science and the progress of fusion. Uh, you've obviously, as a nuclear scientist, been aware of what's been going on. Uh, yes, I I, um, I find it fascinating that we now very much have not a race but healthy competition between the the, the magnetic confinement plasma fusion that's the research carried out here at Cullum and then the inertial confinement laser driven fusion uh, at places like NIF in, in California. Um, I guess like most people here, you know, we're, the question everyone has always asked is, so you always say it's 25, 30 <laughs> years in the future, is that number coming down? I tend to be optimistic. I tend to think that at last we are seeing, rather than it always being 25, mm. 30 years away, we're now eating into those years. So it's still some while away, but I think it's mm -hmm. exciting that fusion is making process of, of progress. And of course, with, with the, the new ITER project in France, the next generation after JET, I think it, it, things are starting to build up a certain mm. head of steam. Yeah. Now, as a physicist who does a lot of communication, um, how important do you feel that is for, for physicists generally, for scientists generally, to get out and do, do a little bit of talking to the well, public? When I started in science communication and outreach back in the early 90s probably, it was very much uh, regarded as something that you, you shouldn't do too much of. You know, I was very research active then and I had research grants and, and publishing papers and my, my, my senior colleagues would try to, try to warn me off going off and giving schools talks or mm -hmm. radio interviews or writing a magazine article. That attitude has changed. I think now the UK certainly leads the world in public engagement in science. You're seeing posts cropping up in universities. You know, I hold a, 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 mm. chair, a joint chair in physics and in public engagement in science. In, in other universities are doing this as well. It's now become respectable and part of the responsibility of what academics should do. You know, you should do your teaching, you should do your research and various other administrative duties. Those are the three traditional roles of an mm. academic. Now communicating what you do mm -hmm. and, 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 and explaining science to the wider public mm -hmm. is also regarded as important. So I think it's vitally important mm. uh, uh, that more people do it. So mm. it's not left to the likes of me and some chap called Brian Cox. Right. And should it be taught as part of a degree, for example? It certainly should be part of a degree in the same way that general communication skills are taught. How to yeah. write your CV, how to, to, to give a presentation. Mm. You should also learn, even if you never do it, how to write a press release, mm. how to give a radio interview, mm. um, you know, explain what you do to your grandmother. You know, you know, when you're doing something technical and mathematical, mm -hmm. the challenge is to try and explain it. And it's not dumbing down. That's something yeah. that's gone out of, out of fashion very much, thankfully mm. now. You're not dumbing down, you're just using the appropriate language to mm. someone who hasn't had the benefit of years of talking mm. jargon. Mm. Mm. So I think it's very important, I th and I certainly think, you know, I I'd encourage a lot of science and engineering uh, degree courses to try and incorporate some sort of science communication um, skills into their syllabus. It would be wonderful to see. We've been chatting with Jim Al-Khalili, the Professor of Nuclear Physics from Surrey University and BBC broadcaster. Thank you very much, Jim. Pleasure.